In this video, we're going to discuss systems of linear equations in two variables. So picture a system of equations, two variables, two equations. So first off, what is a system of equations? A system of any type is a set of two or more equations that define a relationship among whatever variables we have in the system. So when we talk about solving a system of equations, anything that we're proposing as a solution must satisfy, in other words, it must make true all equations in the system. Ultimately, that's the challenge of solving a system of equations rather than just solving one equation. So if you have a single equation, single variable, you're just solving for that one variable and it has to make that one equation true. Well, if we have a system, typically we have more than one variable. Anything we're proposing as a solution has to have a set of variable values that actually satisfies every single equation in the system. So if we find values that satisfy one equation, but they don't actually work in one of the other equations in the system, then they don't actually represent values um, that solve the system. So essentially we're solving the equations in tandem. We have to use all equations in the system at the same time in order to verify that the values we get are working in all of the equations that represent our system. So here we're gonna talk about a couple of different algebraic ways to solve a system of equations, specifically the methods of substitution and addition, sometimes called elimination. So let's start with substitution. So to solve our system using substitution, number one, first thing we wanna do is we want to isolate one variable in one equation. Now ultimately it doesn't matter which equation you pick and which variable you pick, but typically you wanna pick a variable that has a coefficient of one. So I'm gonna put a note here. Look for a coefficient of one coefficient of one. In other words, you're looking for a variable that's going to be easy to isolate. If you can find a variable that has a coefficient of one, then all that you're gonna to have to do to solve for that particular variable is add or subtract other terms in that equation. If the variable you choose has a coefficient other than one, then in order to isolate it, you'd have to divide out that coefficient. The problem there is you potentially create fractions where you'd like to avoid them. So if you can find a variable that has a coefficient of one, then that's typically going to be the variable you want to choose to isolate. Now, once you have that variable isolated, it's going to be variable is equal to an expression involving the other variable in the system. So the variable that you isolated, you are then going to substitute hence the name substitution for the method, you're going to substitute for that variable in the other equation. I'm gonna underline this, this is really important. You choose one equation to isolate. When you substitute, you have to use the other equation. You can't isolate in one equation and then resub into the same equation. In other words, in steps one and two, you end up using both equations. So you isolate a variable in one equation and then you substitute, you replace that variable in the other equation. Now, once you do that, the result is now one new equation that only has a single variable. So rather than having X and Y, or whatever variables we happen to be using, you're now gonna have an equation that only has the one variable. So you're then going to solve for the value of that variable that's still left in that new equation you created. And so at that point, you'll have one of the values that represents the solution to your system. So once you determine what that value is going to be, you're going to re-substitute, re-substitute that value to solve for the other one. And at that point, you can plug into either of the equations in the original system. Doesn't matter which one you choose. So when should you use substitution as a method to solve your system? It's gonna be a good method to use when it's easy to solve for one of the variables. In other words, look for that coefficient of one. If you can solve for that particular variable that has a coefficient of one, substitution is going to be a good option. <clears throat> now in most cases, your solution when you solve your system will be a single ordered in other words, 
you're going to solve. Your system has potentially two equations, probably two equations, two variables, x and y. When you solve, in most cases, you're going to get a single x value, a single y value. Together, those are considered to be an ordered pair. Now, in these situations, again, this is the most common situation, we say that the system is consistent. We can classify the system as consistent which just means it can be solved. A consistent system can be solved. It does have a solution. And the equations themselves are said to be independent of one another. They are independent equations. In other words, each individual one contributes new information to the system about the variables. We'll also look at a situation where the equations are not independent and that's going to lead us to a different situation. So here's our system. We want to solve this system using the substitution method. So I'm going to start by labeling my equations as 1 and 2. The benefit of doing this is, remember, in our first two steps for substitution, we have to verify that whatever equation we used in the first step, we use the other equation in the second step. So by numbering our equations, it's going to be easier to verify that we are, in fact, using both equations. So I need to choose one equation and choose one of the variables to isolate. So how do I know which one to choose? Well again, I'm looking for a coefficient of one. If I can find a variable that has a coefficient of one, that's going to be the easiest one to isolate. So in this case, the only variable that has a coefficient of one is going to be the y in the second equation. Notice if I tried to isolate the x or tried to isolate x or y in the first equation, I'd end up having to divide out a coefficient and that's going to create fractions unnecessarily. So ideally, I'm going to choose equation 2. I'm going to label it. I'm going to rewrite it. 4x plus y is equal to 5. And then in that equation, I want to isolate this variable y. So I can isolate the y by subtracting 4x, moving it to the other side. So y is going to be equal to 5 minus 4x. You can write it that way. You can write it as negative 4x plus 5. Your choice doesn't matter. So now what I ultimately have is an expression that relates y and x, where y is written in terms of x. So what this ultimately means is that anywhere in the system that I see a y, I could put 5 minus 4x instead because they are algebraically, logically equivalent. So I'm going to go to my first equation. And again, I just want to write down the equation to start with. Don't try to make any changes until you've written down what you start with. And what this expression now tells me is that wherever I see a y, I could put 5 minus 4x instead because again, they're logically equivalent. So I'm going to substitute in this equation. This is where I do the actual substitution. I'm going to substitute for y with this expression I found relating y and x. And negative 5x, I'm going to leave that alone. So we now have negative 5x minus 4. And then I'm going to replace my y with 5 minus 4x. I'm going to plug it in. Now, as with any other situation, when you plug it in, you want to put parentheses around it. That's going to help you take care of all your signs. And notice in this case, if 4 is multiplied by y, then 4 also needs to be multiplied by everything that we're replacing y with. So we'll have to distribute that 4 or the negative 4 to both of those terms in parentheses. What's the benefit of doing this, though? What's happened? Well, now we have a new equation that's a combination of the first two, but this new equation only contains the variable x. We've now eliminated that variable y, so we have an equation where we can actually isolate that single variable. So first thing I need to do is clean everything up. So distribute that negative 4. So we have negative 5x, negative 4 times 5 is going to be negative 20. And then careful with your signs, negative 4 times negative 4x is going to be positive 16x. <clears throat> and that's equal to 2. Okay, so combine our like terms. So the x terms combine, and we can go ahead and move the 20 over as well if we want. So negative 5x plus 16x is going to give us positive 11x. And then add the 20, move it over. That's going to give us 22. So that means, dividing by 11, x is going to be 2. Once we have the value for x, remember we still need to find the value for y. 
So you're going to have to resubstitute this value into one of the equations. So I could sub it in here in the first one. I could sub it into the second one. Or alternatively, notice this expression for y that we found is really just the second equation rearranged. But 4x plus y is equal to 5, and y is equal to 5 minus 4x are logically equivalent. They mean the same thing. So another option I have is to just sub in that value in this particular version of the second equation. The benefit of doing that is y, the variable I'm solving for, is already isolated at that moment. So once I plug in the value for x, all I have to do is simplify that down, and that's immediately going to give me the value for y. So I'm going to take that approach. It will probably save a little bit of time. So that's our expression for y. We know now that x has to be 2, so we're going to sub that in. So y is equal to 5 minus 4 times 2, otherwise known as 5 minus 8, which is negative 3. So that is going to be our value for y. So each of these original equations is a linear equation. If we were to graph these two equations, they graph as two diagonal lines. We now found that x is 2 and y is negative 3 in this system. What this represents is the ordered pair, specifically 2, negative 3, where these two lines would intersect if we were to graph them. So our solution is the ordered pair 2, negative 3, and this is going to be the location where the graphs of these two lines would intersect. It's the one ordered pair that those two graphs have in common. So let's look at a couple more examples. So that's an example of what's going to happen when we have a single independent solution. Now that's not always going to be the case. So in some cases, when we do our substitution or use whatever solving technique we want, solving is going to lead to an algebraic contradiction. In other words, it's going to lead us to creating an equation that can't actually be true, that's never true, that's just by default a false statement. If this happens, then the system is said to be inconsistent. So if consistent means that we can solve the equation, it does have a solution, then inconsistent means there is no solution to the system. So essentially it means somehow these two equations can't work in tandem. If we were to think of this graphically, then a consistent system has some location where our equations and their graphs overlap. An inconsistent system, if we're talking about linear equations, means that if we were to graph these two equations, there isn't actually a location where the two lines are going to cross. So in that case, the lines that we graph would end up being parallel. So let's graph this one, or let's solve this one using substitution. Now here, we don't actually have a variable that has a coefficient of 1. So in some situations, substitution might not be a good option. But if we can look at all the different variables and all their coefficients, there may be one that's still easy to isolate. We'll look at the second equation. So let's label them again, 1 and 2. Look at our second equation. Notice x is almost already isolated by itself. The only thing that's in front of it is that 2, so we would need to divide out that 2 to isolate the x. But look at what 2 is going to divide into. It's going to divide into a 6, and it's going to divide into negative 4. 6 and negative 4 are both divisible by 2. So sometimes dividing the coefficient will create fractions unnecessarily. But here, if we choose to divide out that 2, it's going to divide into two numbers that are divisible by 2, and we're not actually going to create any fractions. So that's going to be a good option here. So we're going to use equation 2, rewrite it as is, and then we're going to isolate our x by dividing 2 into each of the terms in this equation. So we end up with x is equal to 3 minus 2y. So just as with the previous system, we now have an expression for one variable in terms of the other. So what this tells me is that anywhere I see an x, I could logically replace it with 3 minus 2y because they're algebraically equivalent. So I've used equation 2. Now I'm going to use equation 1 to do my substitution. So let's rewrite the equation. 
I'm substituting to replace x, so I'm replacing the x. So negative four times my expression for x in terms of y. So three minus two y minus eight y is equal to two. Okay, now we need to distribute this negative four. So negative 12, negative four times negative two y, watch your signs, it's a positive eight y. And then we have a negative eight y, it was already part of that equation and that is equal to positive two. Now notice our variable terms are already on the same side of the equation, so we just wanna combine them. Positive eight y and negative eight y, well those are actually equal and opposite. So those terms actually cancel out. What are we left with? We're left with negative 12 on the left, and we're left with two on the right. Negative 12 is equal to two. Well that, is a false statement. That's what we've referred to as a contradiction. There's no way that negative 12 and two are ever equivalent. So two things have happened. Number one, we ended up with something that's just undeniably false, but notice we've also dropped off all our variables. By doing the substitution for x, the result is that y was ultimately eliminated. So we end up with an equation that not only is false, but we now don't have a variable to solve for. So because we've fallen into this particular situation, this now means that we have a system that has no solution. So the solution here is there is none, so no solution. Now you might be wondering, did this happen because we solved for x first? In other words, suppose I'd chosen maybe the first equation or the second and solved for y and then substituted for y. Would the same thing have happened? And the answer is yes you may not have ended up with the same contradiction, but if you isolated y and wrote it in terms of x and then substituted for y, you would still end up with a contradiction. You would still be led to the same conclusion that the solution is actually not there. It's no solution, that the system is inconsistent. So the conclusion we reach is going to be independent of the technique we use to solve. So in this case, anytime we get that contradiction, something that's just categorically false and our variables are eliminated, that's our indication that there is no solution. Now there's one final situation that we'll see from time to time. In other cases, rather than solving and getting a contradiction, sometimes we can solve and get an algebraic identity. An identity is a statement that is always true. Two equals two is always true. Regardless of anything else, two equals two is always true. So in this case, the system is consistent. There is a solution. We can find a solution. But rather than having independent equations, we say that our equations are dependent. Ultimately, what that means is that they are copies of each other. In an independent system, the two equations are truly independent. They're truly different from one another. So each one contributes new information about the system. Well, in some situations, you'll end up with a system where one equation may look different from the other, but algebraically speaking, they're actually equivalent. So adding the additional equation into the system doesn't actually give you any additional information about the variables. So we can solve the system, but what it ultimately means is that we're not going to get a unique ordered pair that solves the system. There's actually going to be infinitely many solutions. Now we have to be careful when we say infinitely many solutions. We have to think about what solutions look like. This does not mean that the solution is all real numbers. That is not what it means. The solution is related to all real numbers. But think about what a solution looks like. If we're talking about a system of equations where we have an x and a y, solutions are ordered pairs. All real numbers is just a set of numbers. Okay, we're talking about ordered pairs. We're talking about a value for x and a value for y. But there's infinitely many x's and y's that make our equation true, or make our system true, rather. So the solution infinitely many, the solution is all ordered pairs that are going to take on a specific form 
that meet the requirements of the two equations in the system. So to find the form, what we're going to think of as a general form, you're going to leave either x or y as a variable. You're going to leave it variable. It can change. It can vary. And then you're going to solve for the other variable in terms of whatever's left over. So if you isolate x, or if you leave x, you're going to solve for the other in terms of x. You're going to solve for y in terms of x. If you leave y as a variable, then you're going to solve for x in terms of y. So essentially, you'll leave one of them variable. We call this a parameter. So whichever one you leave variable, we call this a parameter. Essentially, it's an open variable. What it means is that we can actually choose any value we want for that particular variable, but the other variable, the other value, has to be related to this choice in a specific way based on how we write our general solution. In other words, how we write the formula that expresses how one value is related to another value. So we'll leave one of our variables, truly variable, we call that our parameter. We can choose values for that variable, but the other variable has to be related to this one we've chosen, this value we've chosen, based on a formula we're going to find. That formula is going to be related to the actual equation or equations that we started with in our system. So let's look at an example of one of these kinds of systems. How do you identify something like this? Okay, so we want to solve using substitution. We're going to write the general solution, aka the formula that represents all the solutions, and then we want to find three individual solutions. In other words, ones with specific values. If there's infinitely many, well, let's find three of them. Now here, substituting is actually going to be pretty quick. So let's label our two equations. Okay. Notice in equation one, we actually already have a variable isolated. Y is already isolated. So why not just substitute Y? We don't actually have to isolate a variable, it's already done. So we can just substitute directly into our next equation. So I'm gonna substitute into equation two, replacing the variable Y with this equivalent expression for it. So equation two is gonna become eight X minus four times Y replaced with 2x minus 1 and then all of that is equal to 4. So let's simplify it down, distribute the negative 4, watch your signs. So 8x minus 8x and then negative 4 times negative 1 is going to be positive 4 equal to 4. Notice again we have matching terms equal and opposite but what are we left with now? We're left with 4 on the left and we're left with four on the right. This statement, this algebraic statement is now true. It's what we call an identity. Four is equal to four, no matter what values y and x take on. So, but ultimately we're still stuck without any variables to solve for. We substituted in place of y, leaving x, but the x is eliminated. The same thing would have happened if we'd substituted for x, if we'd chosen not to use this substitution and isolated x and substituted for that instead. We might end up with a different identity, but we would still end up with an identity and no variable left to solve for. So what that ultimately means is that we have infinitely many solutions, but they're solutions that have to fit a specific form. They have to fit the form specified by these equations. Believe it or not, these equations are actually duplicates of one another. Imagine taking equation two, notice all these values, all these constants, they have a common factor of four. Well, what if you divided out that four? Well, this would become a two, this would become a negative one, and this would become a one. If you then rearrange these terms, you would have equation one verbatim. So even though one and two look slightly different, because they only differ by a constant multiple, they're actually the same equation, logically speaking. So equation two is actually just a duplicate of equation one. But these two equations do give a relationship between the variable x and the variable y that we must abide by. 
So we're going to let one of our variables remain variable. Again, we call that the parameter. We get to choose values for that variable, but the other variable has to be related in terms of a particular formula. Now, how do we know which variable to leave variable and which one to solve for? Well, notice here we have a formula for y in terms of x. So because we have a formula for y, it's going to be better to let x be the value we choose. So if we let x be the value that we get to choose, then all we'd have to do is sub in that particular value we choose, evaluate this expression, and then automatically we know what y has to be. So that means we're going to let x be the parameter. We're going to keep x as a variable, and then y will just be related in terms of this particular formula right here. So our general solution is going to be all ordered pairs that meet the requirements based on that substitution. So here's how we're going to write that. We're going to use something called set builder notation. So I'm going to write curly braces. That gives me a set. So when I write a set of solutions, I write them in curly braces. I'm going to write an ordered pair, but it's not going to be an ordered pair with specific constant values. It's going to be an ordered pair that's variable. It's going to be the formula for how we find individual ordered pairs. Remember, we're going to leave x as a variable. It's going to be the value we choose. So x is just x. That's going to be the value that we choose. We can let it be 1, we can let it be 0, we can let it be anything we want, as long as y is related to x using this specific relationship. So if we choose x, y has to be related to it via the formula 2x minus so we choose x, and then y has to be related to it in this specific way. Then we're going to draw a vertical line. The way we read this is all x, all ordered pairs of this form, such that, and then we write whatever conditions there are on this variable that we're choosing. So we can say x is any real number, or is a real number. and then close the brace. So it's all ordered pairs that fit this form for any value where x is a real number. So again, what does this mean? It means we can choose any value we want for x. x can be any real number. But based on the value we choose for x, we then have to solve for the associated y using this particular formula. So this represents all the possible solutions we can find. Any ordered pair that fits this formula is a solution. So if we want individual solutions, we specifically want to find three of them, all we have to do is choose specific values for x and then solve for the associated value for y. It doesn't give us any limitations on the x we choose, so choose whatever you want. I'm going to choose negative 1, 0, and 1. So I'm going to let x be negative 1, I'm going to let x be 0, and I'm going to let x be 1. And then based on the value if we choose, we just have to solve for what the associated y would be. So y is related to x using the formula 2x minus 1. So if x is negative 1, then y has to be 2 times negative 1 minus 1. So 2 times negative 1 is negative 2. Negative 2 minus 1 is negative 3. So one ordered pair that solves this system is negative 1, negative 3. Now what if x is 0? Same idea. x can be 0, but y has to be related to it in this particular way. So if x is 0, y is going to be 2 times 0 minus 1. 2 times 0 is 0. 0 minus 1 is negative 1. So another solution would be 0, negative 1. And then if x is 1, y is related via the formula. So it would be 2 times 1 minus 1, 2 times 1 is 2, 2 minus 1 is 1. So when x is 1, y is 1. So these three individual ordered pairs represent three individual solutions to this system. Three out of infinitely many, but three that would be solutions to the system. So what would this look like if we graphed it? So if we have two independent equations, we graph them, they're both lines, we're looking for the ordered pair that represents the location where they intersect. If the solution happens to be inconsistent, 
they're never going to intersect, which means the lines are parallel. Here, we have one equation that's in slope intercept form. We have one equation that's in standard form. But as we've determined, these two equations are actually algebraically equivalent. They only differ by a constant multiple. So if we were to graph these, because they're actually the same equation, they're actually going to look the same. It's literally going to be one line on top of the other. One line is going to coincide with the other. So every ordered pair on that common line represents a solution. This is the form that all of those ordered pairs are going to take on, and these are three of the ordered pairs that will appear on that common line. So that's the general idea. Anytime we have two variables, those are going to be the only three situations we run into. Now as we add additional variables, we can run into more complicated situations, at least graphically speaking. The way we solve the systems will ultimately be the same. We're going to talk about some other techniques for solving as well. But in general, the graphs can get a little bit more complicated as soon as we have an additional variable. We're now in three dimensions. So it just fundamentally is a little bit more complicated. Now let's talk about another way we can solve a system. This is called the addition method. Sometimes you'll see it called the elimination method. So if necessary, here's our method. If necessary, you want to start by rearranging. If necessary, you want to rearrange rearrange the equations so that they are both in standard form. For a linear equation, standard form is going to be ax plus by is equal to c. a, b, and c could be negative numbers. This doesn't have to be addition. But ultimately, you want to have constant coefficients for x and y. You want to have x and y on the same side in alphabetical order. And ideally, you want a, b, and c to all be integers. So if there are any fractions or decimals, you want to eliminate those. We'll talk about how you do that. Then you are going to multiply one or possibly both equations by a constant that's going to create opposite coefficients for one of the variables. So for instance, if you have a 2x in one equation, what would eliminate a 2x? Well, you'd need a negative 2x to eliminate it. So you're going to multiply the other equation by whatever it would take to make that x a negative 2x. Since you're doing the same thing to both sides of the equation when you multiply by that constant, you're not fundamentally changing anything. You're changing what one of the equations looks like, but you're not actually changing its algebraic meaning. So you're going to multiply by whatever constant or constants you need to get one of the variable's coefficients to match. Now, opposite is going to be important. It has to be the same value, but one has to be positive and one has to be negative. They have to be terms that would combine together and reduce to zero. So one's going to be positive and one's going to be negative. So that's the general idea. We want to then combine them. So you're going to add the two equations together, which is going to eliminate one of the variables. So add, hence the term addition, eliminating, hence the term elimination. Essentially what you now have is the same thing you have after you do substitution. You now have a new equation, different from the previous two, that only has one variable in it. So you want to solve for the remaining variable, get that value, and then resubstitute into one of the original equations in order to solve for whatever variable is left. So notice these last two steps are the same for addition as they are for substitution. Ultimately, what's different is how you get rid of a variable. Substitution allows you to get rid of a variable. Addition or elimination allows you to get rid of a variable as well. You're just doing it in a different way. So when will you use this particular method? Well, technically, you can use either whenever you want. Both are completely valid regardless of the situation. But this is going to be a good option when it's more difficult to solve for one of the variables. So in other words, when substitution is inconvenient, this may be a good option. You may end up liking this method so much you want to use it the whole time anyway and not even worry about substitution, which is perfectly fine. It's ultimately your choice. Now one thing we need to keep in mind is using this method and using it in a good way may require you to clear any fractions 
four decimals in order to be easy to use. Why do we need to do this? Well, getting matching coefficients, knowing what to multiply by in order to get those matching coefficients is a little bit more difficult if the coefficients you start with are fractions or decimals. So ideally, you wanna get rid of any fractions or decimals that you start with in order to put yourself in a good position in order to be able to find those coefficients. So we'll talk about how you eliminate those in a couple examples. So let's look at our first example. So we're gonna have three. We wanna solve each system using the addition method. And if it applies in the situation where it applies, we wanna write the general solution and then three individual solutions. So here's our first system. We want to solve this one using the elimination or addition method. So first thing we wanna do is take both of these equations and write them in standard form. In other words, we need to rearrange everything so that both variable terms are on the same side. We have a constant on the other side. So our first equation, we can actually put in standard form in one step. All I need to do is move the y term over so I can add 4y, move that over. So that's gonna give me 11x plus 4y is equal to negative five. And if we want, we can label these. So this is going to be our standard form for equation one. Now a little bit more work is involved in equation two. First thing we need to do is distribute that two. We can't really move terms around while there's still parentheses involved. So we'll start by distributing. So that's gonna be two x minus four y is equal to 22 plus y. Okay, so we've got x and y on the same side, but we also have a y on the right-hand side. So we need to move that over, subtract it, combine your like terms. So that's gonna be two x minus five y is equal to 22. So these two equations are now going to be the ones we use in order to do our addition. So I'm going to write them one on top of the other. I want to line up those matching variables. So 11x plus 4y is equal to negative 5, and then 2x minus 5y is equal to 22. Now if I were to add these equations as is, I would not eliminate a variable. I would combine my x's and I'd have 13 x's. I'd combine my y's and I'd have a negative y. So I would have a new equation that's closely related to these two, but it would still be an equation that has two variables. I wouldn't be able to solve for a remaining variable the way I want to. So what I wanna do is I wanna take these two equations and one or both, I want to multiply by something that will get a coefficient pair to match, but to have opposite signs. So how do we know which one to choose? Ultimately, it doesn't matter. We can eliminate the x's, we can eliminate the y's, doesn't matter. I would argue that here, maybe y is gonna be easier to eliminate. Here's why. One term is already positive and one term is already negative. So we've already taken care of the opposite signs here. All we need now is for these coefficients to match. So opposite in sign, but same absolute value otherwise. Well, we want something that we could match up here that's related to four and five. So we need something that's a multiple of both four and five. Well, 20 is a multiple of both four and five. So if I could turn my four into a 20 and then turn my five into a 20, then I now have matching but opposite coefficients that would then combine to cancel out. Well, how would I get a 20 here? Well, the four, we would need to multiply by five, and then the five, we would need to multiply by four. So I'm gonna take both sides of this first equation, and I'm going to multiply both sides by five that's going to give me the positive 20 that I want as my coefficient for y. Keep in mind, everything else has to be multiplied by five as well in order to keep the equation in balance. Now I want a negative 20 for this particular y. I've got a five, so I'm gonna multiply by a four. And that should do the trick. So let's take the first equation we need to distribute that five. So five times 11x is going to be 55x. Five times four y plus 20y 
is equal to negative 25. Easiest mistake is you forget to multiply on the other side. You have to multiply every single term in the equation by whatever constant you've chosen. Now second equation, distribute the four. So that's going to be 8x, four times negative 5y is negative 20y. Okay, see how these match up, but they're opposites. That's the goal, that's what we want. And then four times 22 is going to be 88. So now that we have these matching but opposite coefficients, we're going to combine these two equations together. We're gonna to add them together. Why is this legal? Well, we're combining things that are all equivalent. So if this particular side of the equation is, multi is um, equal to negative 25, then by adding this to something, it's the same thing as adding negative 25 to that. So ultimately things stay in balance because I'm adding things that are like to each side of the equation. Now my y's are eliminated, and again that was the goal, but I need to combine whatever's left over. So 55x plus 8x, that's going to be 63x, and then negative 25 plus 88, well if I'm not mistaken that's also going to be 63. Let's verify that. So if you have a calculator, just verify that. There's no sense in not using one if you can. So negative 25 plus 88, sure enough, 63. Okay, so now we're in a good position to be able to solve for x. 63 times x is equal to 63, so divide our 63. That means x is equal to 1. So that is going to be half of our solution. Now we need to solve for y. You can choose either equation maybe choose the first one just because it's going to be easier to substitute. So we're going to substitute in our 1 here. So let me rewrite the equation. So 11x is equal to negative 5 minus 4y. We know that x is equal to 1, so I'm going to substitute that value. And then I'm going to solve for y. So 11 times 1 is 11. I'm going to move my 5 over, so add it, move it over. So 11 plus 5 is going to be 16. So 16 is equal to, watch your signs, you still have a negative, so negative 4y. And then if I divide by negative 4, y is going to be equal to negative 4. So my solution is going to be x equals 1 and y equals negative 4, the ordered pair with those two values. Now we haven't done this yet, but technically speaking, you can always check your work. How do you check your work? Well, if you substitute these two values back to your original two equations, both two equations should be satisfied. You should be able to sub in these values for the first one, and that for equation is then true. Sub in the values for the second, and that equation is also true. So that's something to consider doing, particularly if this technique is new to you and you haven't solved systems of equations before or haven't done it in a while. You can always go back and check your work. Okay, let's look at a slightly more complicated example. We also want to solve this system using the addition method, but look at that second equation. Notice we have some fractions. So ideally, we want to clear our fractions first before we try to get our matching coefficients, anything like that. Now our first equation, we also need to do a little bit of work with that. So I'm going to label these two, one and two. Let's start with the first one. So I need to distribute four, so four times x minus eight is equal to six y plus three. So I actually need to move two terms here. I need to move the eight over to the right and I need to move the 6y over to the left. So we can do that in two steps or we can do it in one. So 4x minus 6y and then positive 3 and we're going to add an 8 and move that over so that'll be positive 11. So that'll be the standard form we're going to work off of. Now we also need to do the same thing with the second equation that has all of those fractions. Don't be alarmed by the fractions there is a quick and easy way to get rid of all of them in one step. Now notice in terms of where all the terms are, we're actually good. X and Y are on the same side. There's a constant on the other side. So except for the fact that we have fractional constants, we're in the right form. We just want to get rid of all of those denominators. Here's what you're going to do. Take all of your denominators, so we have a 4, an 8, and a 2. 
if we were to get a common denominator among all of those, what would the least common denominator be? Well, it would have to be eight. Eight, of course, is a factor of itself. Eight is a multiple of eight, rather. Eight is a multiple of four. Eight is a multiple of two, and it happens to be the smallest one. So rather than actually changing every fraction to have a denominator of eight, I'm gonna use that common denominator in a different way. I'm actually gonna multiply every single term in this equation by that common multiple of eight. So I'm gonna multiply my left-hand side by an eight, and I've run out of space, so I'm just gonna write it right there. And then the same thing on the right-hand side, I'm also gonna multiply that by eight. The effect is that because eight has four as a factor and eight has two as a factor, and of course eight has itself as a factor, all of those denominators are going to cancel out. And we ultimately just have to determine what the numerators are gonna be. So we're gonna multiply the eight times one fourth. You can think of it as eight over one if it helps. So eight times one on top, we'll do it in two steps, eight times one on top, four times one on the bottom, so that's gonna be four. That's now our coefficient for x. Now over here, eight times three is gonna be 24. Okay, and then eight times one in the denominator is just gonna be eight. That's gonna be our coefficient for y. And on the other side, it's negative. Don't forget that sign. Eight times one is gonna be eight. And then two times one is going to be two. Look at all the coefficients though. Notice they all can reduce. So eight divided by four is gonna be two. So two x. 24 divided by eight is gonna be three. So negative three y. And then negative eight over two is going to be negative 4. So this, this particular equation that doesn't have any fractions is algebraically equivalent to that equation we started with and this is the one we're going to work off of. So now let's take those two equations and let's line them up. So 4x minus 6y is equal to 11 and then 2x minus 3y is equal to negative 4. Now with the previous system, we had a pair of terms where one was positive, one was negative from one equation to the next. Here, positive, positive, negative, negative, we don't have those opposite signs. So choosing one to eliminate versus the other, it's not gonna be a big deal here. Let's eliminate the x's this time though since we did the y's before. So I have a four x on top and a two x on the bottom. I want to get equal but opposite coefficients. So here I can actually just multiply one equation by something and that's going to take care of it. Let's leave the 4x. I can change a 2x into something that cancels with that 4x with the multiplication of just one constant. So I want to get, what do I want to get? Well I want to eliminate a 4x and the term that's going to eliminate a 4x is going to be a negative 4x. So what multiple, what would I need to multiply by to take a two to a negative four? Well, if I multiplied a two by a negative two, that would then change this coefficient into the negative four that I want. So I'm gonna multiply both sides of this equation by that negative two that's going to get me the coefficient that I want. And so now, leaving that first equation alone. I'm going to distribute that negative two, multiply it by all three terms. So negative two times two x is negative four x. So those are equal and opposite, that's what we want. Negative two times negative three y is gonna be positive six y. And then negative four times negative two is going to be positive eight. And now I can combine my two equations. So the goal was to eliminate the x's. We have a positive 4x and negative 4x. Those go away. What about the y's though? Notice we have a negative 6y and a positive 6y as a result of that distribution of negative two. These actually are equal and opposite as well. So what does that leave us with on the left-hand side of the equation? Well, if both pairs of terms were eliminated, then all we're left with is a zero. What about the right-hand side, though? 
we have a positive 11 plus a positive 8, so that's going to be 19. So what we've ended up with is a contradiction. It's a statement that's false. We don't have a variable left to solve for, and we also have an equation that just is not true, fundamentally is not true. So in that case, there is no solution. We would say this particular system is inconsistent. There is no solution. So we've seen a consistent one, one solution, independent equations, exactly one solution. We've seen an inconsistent one. Let's see what happens with that special case. We're consistent, but we're dependent. Okay, so here we have a fraction, but we also have some decimals as well. So we've got a couple different things we need to work on here. So here's our first equation, here's our second, let's label them first equation. Now we only have one fraction to get rid of, so let me write this down. So 2x is equal to y divided by 2 plus 1. So we only have this one fraction, this one denominator to eliminate. So if we multiply everything by 2, that will eliminate a denominator of 2. So this one, we can just multiply both sides by a 2. So that means we're going to have a 4x on the left. This 2 needs to distribute on the right-hand side. So when it distributes here, those common 2s will be eliminated, just leaving us with a y. And then don't forget to multiply it by that remaining term. So 2 times 1 is going to be 2. Now we want to get it in standard form. Don't forget that part. So I'm going to subtract the y and move it over. So 4x minus y is equal to Two. There's our standard form. Okay, now for the next equation, we need to eliminate our decimals. We want to take these decimals and we want to convert them to integers while keeping this equation in balance. Now here's the trick here. With fractions, you want to find your least common denominator and then just multiply through by it, which is going to eliminate all the denominators you have in your problem. When it comes to decimals, we're going to do something similar, but what we want to focus on is the place values we have represented in our decimals. So notice for each of these, we've gone out to the hundredths place. We have tenths, we have hundredths. Each of these goes out to the hundredths place. In order to eliminate decimals, this is four hundredths. We could think of this as four over 100, one over 100, two over 100. What would we do to get rid of that denominator of 100? Well, we'd multiply by 100. So what we need to do is if we can identify the furthest out place value, then multiplying by that particular place as a whole number is then going to take these decimals and it's going to convert them to integer values. So because the furthest out place happens to be the same for all three of the decimals, it's the hundredths place, we can multiply both sides by 100 and that is going to convert these decimals to integers. So I'm going to multiply both sides by 100. And you may want to do this in the calculator, but ultimately multiplication by powers of 10, we can actually model that just by moving the decimal. So if you multiply by 100, that tells you to move the decimal two places to the right. So 0 0.04, move your decimal two places, 0 0.04 becomes just a 4. So that's going to become 4x. 0 0.01, move your decimal two places, that's just going to become 1y. So we'll just call that y, and of course it's negative. And then on the other side, 0 0.02, move your decimal two places, that's just going to be a 2. So now we have our two equations. Let's line them up. So 4x minus y is equal to 2. And then also 4x minus y is equal to 2. Notice they are the same. So even though the two original equations looked vastly different, they are actually equivalent, algebraically speaking, and this proves it. All of these versions of these equations are the same. All three versions here are equivalent to the original. This version is equivalent to the original. 
And so both of these equations happen to be the same, including their original versions. They're just different versions of the same equation. That is what we mean by dependence. Ultimately, one equation is just a copy of the other, so we don't get any extra information from the second equation. All we know about the relationship between x and y is generated by that one equation. But one equation is not enough to uniquely solve for x and y. That's why we've ended up in that dependent situation where there are going to be infinitely many solutions. So we want to do two things here. Number one, we want to write the general solution. In other words, what's the formula for generating all the ordered pairs? And then we also want to write three specific solutions based on that formula. So here we don't have a variable solved for like we did before, but we need to solve for one of the variables in terms of the other. So think back to substitution. If you were to solve for a variable, if you were to isolate a variable, which one's going to be easier to isolate? Well, in this case, it's going to be the y. The y has a coefficient of 1. So isolating the y is going to be a little bit easier. If we want to isolate x, we'd have to divide a 4, which is going to create some fractions. So we want to isolate the y instead. Ultimately, we can just switch the y and the 2, and that'll take care of it. So if we add y, move it over, and then subtract 2, move it over, then we end up with y is equal to 4x minus 2. So this is our formula for y in terms of the variable x. So we're going to let x be our parameter. We can pick values for x. And then this tells us how we would find the associated y value. So our general solution is going to be all ordered pairs that fit that formula. So x can be whatever we want, but y has to be related in terms of this expression. So y is 4x minus 2. And then this is going to be the formula that we follow for any x that's a real number. So x is any real number. Okay, so that's the formula that expresses all of our ordered pairs. Any ordered pair that fits this form, and keep in mind x doesn't have to be integer values. It can be any value you want. You could choose x to be pi if you want pi and then 4 pi minus 2 would also be an ordered pair that solves this system. But when you're picking your specific solutions to find, just pick easy x values. I'm going to pick the same ones again. So I'm going to let x be negative 1. I'm going to let x be 0. And I'm going to let x be positive 1. And then we want to solve for y based on those values of x. So if x is negative 1, then y is going to be 4 times negative 1 minus 2. So that's going to be negative 4 minus 2, which is negative 6. So one ordered pair that solves this system is going to be negative 1, negative 6. If x is 0, then y is going to be 4 times 0 minus 2. 4 times 0 is 0. 0 minus 2 is negative 2. So another ordered pair would be 0, negative 2. And then if x is 1, y is going to be 4 times 1 minus 2. So 4 minus 2 is going to be positive 2. So another ordered pair would be 1, 2. So that shows you all three different situations using both techniques. Either technique is fine. Remember, substitution is going to be a little bit easier when we can isolate a variable. Um, addition or elimination is going to be a better option when isolating a variable is not really going to be easy to do when you don't have a coefficient of 1. But ultimately, you can use elimination in either situation. You can use substitution in either situation. Ultimately, it's just personal preference. So what happens when we have more equations and more variables? When we're talking about real world problems, typically there's more than just two variables involved. In those situations, our systems become increasingly large, increasingly complex, and addition, elimination, substitution, they may not be the best options for how we can solve. So we're also going to talk about how you would solve a system using matrices in an additional video.